Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering UiPath Forward Americas 2019. Brought to you by UiPath. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. This is day two of theCUBE's coverage of UiPath Forward 3. This is the third year of the North American Conference and the second year theCUBE has covered this. Anthony Abatista is here, CUBE alum. He was on last year from, uh, from Deloitte. He's a principal there. Anthony, good to see you again. Great to be here. It's a great day. Yeah, so it is. I mean, we're seeing the growth of, of RPA, generally UiPath, the whole automation. We're starting to talk about intelligent automation. AI has its wings and is starting to to soar, uh, but give us the update from a year ago. We talked about you know, accelerating last year. I, I think it was, you had a, some really good statements around, look at, you, yes, going fast is good, but you want to accelerate the right things, you know, speeding up bad processes, paving the cow path, as I sometimes call it, is really not the way to go, but what's new? So, I do think there's still some issues around getting programs to, you know, to scale and thinking about automation at scale, which has been a major theme here. Um, at the conference um, is still in front of us. People are still figuring out how to climb up that curve. Uh, but what I think is new is, um, when we thought about automation before, it was, it was an or statement. Was it humans or automation? Is a bot going to replace the human? And I really think we've, you know, Deloitte's always had a campaign about I to AI um, that, that we kicked off a couple of years ago and said, you know, how do we have automation and humans interact with each other? And I don't just mean attended, uh, attended bots, but how do we actually start to use automation as, as sort of the glue to hang together a much more rich experience to start to put the AI components in there. So that leads us to the age of width, which is how do we, how do we use the technology um, along with humans to change their role. And there have been some great talks. One of my partners earlier today uh, was, was here with Walmart, his client, mm -hmm. and they talked about how they're redefining the HR processes at Walmart. Um, and that was, uh, that was, I thought, a really good presentation because they changed the workers' work, they didn't replace workers. So, how was this concept of the age of with, how was that different than attended bots? Can you maybe talk about a possible use case or example? So, if we think about um, a call center, um, you know, if we know who's coming in, uh, we used to just look them up and say, hey, do we know who's calling? Uh, now we can say, do we know who's calling? Do they have a history with us? Um, we can use data, and that's another part of the width, is data plus analytics with automation. And we can say, well, what else do we know about this person? Do they have a history of calling us? Do they have an open ticket? Um, have they had some issues or complaints in the past that we can deal with or you know, get in front of? Um, and basically start to put that intelligence in the front end. And that could be unattended, right? That could just be some screen pops um, around automation. But we start to introduce natural language, we start to introduce um, some advanced analytics, and uh, that would be a simple, simple way of enhancing that process. So let me double click on that. So normally what you would get is you're in the other end of the line of the call center and it's like, uh, hold on, I'm just reading the notes. Right. And then they're, you know, they're scanning these notes, it's like an eye test, you know, and they can't, they can't ever get to. See, it's faster for you to just explain. And let me tell you what, you know, <laughs> um, it, what I'm imagining is a different experience where uh, this is happening in near real time. You're either getting pop-ups or you know, some other messaging. Is that Absolutely. what you experience? Um, and how real is this today? This is real, and you know, I, I always like to say automating um, automating is, is easy if you just take the process, repave the cow path, uh, but it's very real because the natural language components, they work up front now, you can ask some questions, you can start to do pre-searches on which materials might, might help with that type of question. Um, you also can train the process over time, so data over time, you know, what's the call satisfaction? Um, did you actually complete um, what it was the call got you know, started about? Um, and how quickly did you do that? So you can train these models and start to use um, you know, machine learning to actually improve that experience even further. So I think that's the, again, back to the width. It's adding these components. I, I like talking to folks with a consulting background because you know, when you're talking to the vendor community, they get very excited about you know, ROI and how you know, uh, lack of disruption for to inst install some software, right? And, and so that's one of the, the advantages, I guess, of RPA is you can pop it into an existing process, good or bad, and get going right away. We've seen this you know, time and time again in the industry. When you have, when you have a big, you know, to force people to change, you know, it's slow. When you can show immediate ROI, you start to see these rocket ships. At the same time, as a consultant, you really
really want to have a bigger impact on a business. You don't want to just um, repeat, you know, automate bad processes. So, it's it, you know, how do you work with clients to sort of manage that that in, insatiable desire for quick ROI, and then the transformative uh, components that you know uh, could maybe defend you from disruption or allow you to be an incumbent disruptor. So I think what's interesting is transformation, you use the word, we, we're really good at transformation programs, so starting to say how do we think of automation first, as we do a traditional transformation program is, is very uh, near and dear to us now. And instead of saying, hey, we're going to bolt the ERP system in and then figure out if we can get some improvement by automating later, we're saying, you know what, let's sort of double, go backwards. Maybe it's a little old fashioned, but what does this whole process look like? And can we put automation in, in launch, not as a process improvement after launch? So, I think when we think of these transformation programs, bigger ERP programs, um, if we're already in there doing it, automation's now on the tip, of, on the front end of that program rather than an afterthought like reporting used to be. Right. So, I mean, you guys have to be technology agnostic in, in your business. I mean, we happen to be at the UiPath conference, but there are, you know, RPA generally, UiPath specifically, it's not a panacea for all problems. I mean, we've talked about AI, we've talked about other automation, process automation capabilities, you've got existing systems, all this stuff has to work together. So, so and people always say, technology lasts, people process first, you guys live that. Um, so how are you seeing um, automation evolve in, in terms of the adoption, um, the, the, how, how people are dealing with existing systems and some of the other technologies that you're having to bring together? So I think the, the first thing is the technology has to work. It has to be you know, bulletproof um, and resilient if you're going to put it in these processes and you know, make, it, make it part of your, your work life or serving clients or that sort of thing. So first it needs to be bulletproof. That's becoming a given. Uh, second, I like to think it's well architected. Um, more and more as you bring in AI or other advanced components, um, you, you need to be ready to have a changing ecosystem. You know, the, the best document processing right now might not be the best in six months. So starting to think of um, your automation solution as that, that technical glue, and does it allow you to swap out or trade components as you, as you um, refine processes going forward or something new hits the market. So now we're working in an ecosystem. And I think for the RPA vendors that are having great success in the market, like UiPath, um, they, they sort of, they give you that platform and they mm -hmm. give you the off ramps and on ramps to integrate the other technologies. And I think, like I said, I think that's table stakes in addition to being bulletproof, uh, but the, the next piece of that is how do we get various people involved in the value proposition of creating automation. So um, various tools and studios, some for the business user that might not be as technical, mm -hmm. so maybe um, self-design a bot at a, um, a process description level, uh, and then maybe a more technical workbench for the technical uh, bot builder. So I'm starting to see that um, in the product suite and some of the announcements here this week, um, how do we tailor the tools to different users and engage them in that process from one end to the other? So, you mentioned scaling before. What are the blockers, what's the challenges of, of scaling? Why does it seem to be so hard? It's clearly an area of focus here at this sure. event. So I think, First of all, the technology is is still new to some areas. There's still back and forth with is it the business or IT led initiative. Um, I think there are some scars and wounds over the last few years with automation where people might have gotten started on the wrong foot. Um, so there's even some redos to learn from. Uh, so I think. You know, people are looking for the business case, um, they're getting more comfortable with it, so the job sizes, the deal sizes are, are getting bigger uh, for the RPA vendors and for us. But I think it's just an evolution. And like I said, there are a lot of stub toes uh, early on in automation. Well, what are some of the big mistakes that you've seen people make? Um, people thinking that um, it's only a business tool or only a technology tool or technology uh, to the point that um, they get started on something and it becomes either a real technology problem or a real business problem. Uh, maybe you build a bot out in the business and you attach it to your ERP system and you cause performance problems um, or you have security problems and then it becomes a real IT problem. I've also seen the reverse where you know, an IT group will start and say, hey, let's do some automation and they push it into some departments. It might not have a fully baked business case. Um, it might not have good support and it becomes a technology science project rather than delivering any real value. I was, I've been trying to, this all week, sort of think about you know, analogies, analogous uh, ascendancies in, in software. 
Um, I, I use ServiceNow a little bit, but that was kind of a heavy lift. It started in IT, it was very clear you know, IT. Um, you're seeing this massive, rapid growth of UiPath, you know, the fastest growing, probably the fastest growing software segment in, in history. Um, and it's and striking to me that we're just now starting to see cloud come into the play here, right? We just, <laughs> UiPath, I think, announced this week it's got this new SaaS capability, which you would think, it would, you know, would be born in the cloud, but people have explained sort of why that is. Um, do you have concerns about the pace of, of growth and a, a company like UiPath and its competitors, their ability to sort of you know, keep up and continue to deliver quality? I mean, you know, a big part of you, what you guys do is sort of risk management sure. as well. So how do you manage that risk? So I think what you look for, um, if you're going to be an alliance partner, um, if you're going to work together and pursue things together, first you have to you know, have the basics. Um, it has to be bulletproof, it has to work. Mm -hmm. um, when you hit bumps in the road, um, you have to have escalation paths that make sense. And you know, there's growing pains in any firm uh, or any company that grows, grows as quickly as, as UiPath. Um, on the other hand, the question is, are your cultures aligned? Do you know how to fix problems? Do you put your customers first? And I think that's what we look like, or look at in the alliance, which is you know, how, do we, how do we partner with people that have similar DNA about customers first, and you put everything else aside, roll your sleeves up, and do the right thing. So uh, that's what we look for in an alliance like this. How, how, you know, we always talk about the buzzwords of digital transformation, which, you know, at conferences like this, it's, it is kind of buzzy, but when you talk to customers, they're actually going through digital transformations. And then, they, a couple years ago, they started experimenting, they bought one of everything, and they'd run things in parallel with, you know, legacy systems, but now they're starting to place their bets, saying, hey, actually, we've got some use cases that are working, we're going to double down on the stuff that, you know, we think works, RPA in some cases fits there, we're going to unplug some of the, uh, the legacy stuff and try to deal with our technical debt. But I guess my question is, how, where do you see RPA fitting in to that whole digital transformation matrix. I like to think of a matrix where you've got different sets of services and you've got different industries that are tapping, you know, all data centric that are that are tapping these new capabilities and formulating new businesses, new industries. That's how you see this disruption happening. And then the incumbent saying, hey, we've got assets too, we're going to tap that same right. matrix. And that, whether it's open source software or, or cloud or you know, new security paradigms or data and analytics. So where do you see RPA fitting? into that matrix? So I think at the, at the glue level, at the architecture level, it can be the orchestrator um, of that experience of, of taking a variety of technologies and integrating them, providing, again, on-ramps and off-ramps, uh, doing what a human can do, looking at screens, you know, analyzing content. Um, so it can be the glue that orchestrates those processes, orchestrates um, maybe some of the um, so it was used to be a void between legacy systems and new systems, and RPA helps take all that away or level the playing field on that. Uh, so it acts as another set of eyes and ears for process integration or, or technology integration. And uh, I, I think that's what is probably its best place now. Are there good process tools there? Can we get, you know, community development's a big discussion. Um, you know, right now, I think some people have been successful at it. Um, but you know, it requires a lot of uh, a lot of care and feeding and planning to have you know your community stay on the rails or you know, stay between the curbs and, and and do useful things. So I think we're in the beginning of how far can we go with community development. Uh, but again, I, I think the technology is really the glue. So community development in terms of um, best practice, uh, sh well, sharing. Yeah, end uh, users um, you know, developing their own bots. Um, yeah. you know, what are the guardrails? Um, does the process they're automating matter? Does it introduce risk? Um, is it going to perform? Um, you know, how, how do you make sure your bots aren't evil that people are creating? It's a, it's a pretty powerful technology. And is there IP in there that you don't want to, we talked well, about this too. last year, that you don't want to necessarily share with, with others? Right. <laughs> so, um, so um, now your role, you used to have focused specifically in financial services, now you're more horizontal, but is, is, how does Deloitte look at this opportunity? Is, is, there, is it an automation practice? Is it, are you, you, you cut across all industries with automation, or is it sort of broader than that? So my colleague here runs the offering, which is, do we have the people, the training, the tools, the delivery centers, uh, and the know-how to go out and do this kind of work, and we've scaled tremendously in, in the automation space. Um, the second part is, how do we look for the adjacencies? So we work very closely um, with our colleagues in AI and ML, and we say, how do we, you know, go do the next generation of this out of the gate. 
Um, how do we experiment? How do we say do you want fries with that as we as we do some of this work? Uh, but then we look for the industry inter intersection, and that's where a firm like Deloitte, we've got deep, deep industry uh, expertise. And we say, what are those intersections where we can go make something happen? We can work with our partners, uh, our alliance, you know, uh, partners in making. Uh, making something happen at an industry specific level or can we go solve a specific problem? So I think that's what we bring that's unique, but we do it both ways. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. It's kind of off the, off the topic here, but you know, I was talking about that matrix before, and again, I'm envisioning technology, horizontal technologies, and then vertical industries, and it used to be for decades. If you were in, an in, if you were in financial services, you were pretty much stuck in financial services. You had a value chain that was specific to financial services, and you knew it inside and out, whether it was product development, or marketing, or sales, distribution, whatever it was. And same thing for, automobiles and manufacturing and education, on and on and on. And you develop these industry you know, areas of expertise and you had domain experts within there and you guys have built up a global powerhouse doing that. But you're seeing as, as digital, as companies become digital, what's the difference between a business and a digital business? It's how they use data, data's at the core. And you're now seeing organizations, companies, tech companies specifically, traverse different industries. You're seeing Amazon you know, in, in content, you're seeing Apple in financial services, other companies getting into healthcare. Um, how is that, first of all, you see that, and what do you think you know, is driving that, and how does that affect your business? Are your clients asking you to help you traverse new, new industries, get into new industries, uh, or defend against others, you know, these big tech companies trying to, with a dual disruption agenda, trying to take them sure. over? and at the center of all that, you mentioned data, but at the center of that is, you know, who are the ultimate customers, and what experience do they want, and how do they want that experience integrated? So it's not channel by channel anymore, more, it's which pieces fit together and how do I want to buy things? Mm. How do I want to be serviced? Um, and you're getting whole cross economies around what, what the consumer wants enabled by technology. Um, I think the other thing that plays into that is you start thinking of the internet of things and how connected people are and how do you use, monetize, um, and, and you know, integrate data. Um, about particular people and, and how they want to be served to, to make that a better experience. I think the consumer ultimately is driving a lot of that and technology is enabling it. Yeah, and as you think about that picture, again, I like to use the metaphor of a matrix. I mean, I see RPA as just, you know, one piece of that, you know, there's so many others. You mentioned IOT, we talk about AI all the time, we talk about blockchain, it's how you put those different, you know, capabilities together and apply them to your business that really, makes the difference, not that, I mean, our RPA right now feels very tactical, um, but it's part of a much more strategic, you know, agenda. Absolutely, uh, and again, it could be the glue in an ecosystem of emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I, I do see it as the eyes and ears. The fact that what you get out of the box from a good RPA vendor um, can really integrate some really uh, really painful things. Yeah, yeah. Like looking at spreadsheets and thinking of guys with green visors, you know, <laughs> looking at <laughs> columns <laughs> and numbers, it's really good at that <laughs> stuff as a, as a base task. Yeah, nothing wrong with tactical and quick ROI. So Anthony, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate your time. Thank you, great to be here. All right, you're welcome. All right, keep right there everybody, we'll be back with our next guest, day two from UiPath Forward in Las Vegas. You're watching theCUBE.